Shalom Aleichem. What I'd like to speak about today is Zehirus Bekvoit Chaveroi. Being careful how we speak and how we act to our fellow Jew. The Chaznish said an amazing thing. He said that the reason, or maybe one of the reasons, why a person comes down to this world is that he should go through his life, his 70, 80, 120 years that he lives in this world and he should be careful never ever to step on anybody's toes, to hurt anybody's feelings. An amazing thing. The Chazanish the giant in Torah learning and the message wasn't how much Torah you could learn but the message was how much are we in this world careful about how we speak and how we react to our fellow friend, our brother and how we speak. There's an amazing Yishalmi and the Yishalmi tells a story about one of the Tanoim who had to cross over a river to go and redeem a, somebody who was stuck in prison, Pidyan Shvuyim. And he needed to cross the river and he told the river, stop flowing, I need to pass. And the river did so. And the wall of the river went higher and higher. And then he decided to go over. And his Talmidim asked, Rabbi, can we come with you? Can we also go over this river as you cross over? And he said an amazing thing. He said, if you know that in your whole life you have never hurt somebody's feelings, you have never ever said something and caused pain to your fellow Jew, then you can go through. What, what he's saying? Maybe the idea lies behind when we're talking about going through life and be careful how we talk and how we react to our fellow, our fellow Jew. This is something which is almost impossible to be able to say that I was careful and I did never ever hurt somebody's feelings. It's something which is not really the Teva Hadvorim, not really the normal way. If somebody can say about himself that I never ever spoke against somebody or ever hurt somebody in any way, then that's against the Teva. And then he can expect the water which stood against the Teva to stand up and not flow how it usually flows. But if a person is going with the usual run of things and he's not so careful, so how can he ask from the river, stop flowing, go against the nature, when where were you? Why didn't you go against the nature? So if you went against the nature and you were careful not to speak bad and not to hurt somebody's feelings, so then you can expect that and his Hamidim let them go through with him. An amazing thought. But if we're asked to do that, we're able to do it and it's something which we have to work on and it's a lifetime work, but it's important. We know many stories of people who Nebuch found out later, many years later, when they started thinking about it and they realized somebody who they may have hurt on the way and they went and asked them for forgiveness and afterwards their own personal sorrow, their own personal thing which wasn't going so right automatically suddenly fixed itself up and flowed how he wanted it to. 
Why shouldn't a person be careful? Why do we have to come afterwards and think, who could it be that I hurt their feelings? And because of that, things are not going so easy for me. There's nobody who we care about more than ourselves. And therefore, a person should make a special effort to think before he speaks. Be careful. It's a person over there. It's, you're hurting somebody's feelings. There's a very chas v'sholem, there's a very high price that can have to be paid for such a thing. We all want to have a calm and a happy and a life which HaKadosh Baruch Hu should give us full of brocha. It's just one message. The Chazanish is saying, be careful. Be careful you don't hurt anybody's feelings. When the Yidin came down to Outer Mitzrayim and they came to the Yamsuf, Hayom Ro Vayonois. The Yam saw, what did it see? Vayonois, and it ran away. It moved aside. Say, Chazal tell us, Vayo, Vaya, Vaya, what did, it, what did they see? He saw the coffin of Yosef, Aruinu Shal Yosef. And therefore, what? Why did that make the Yam split? Because the Yam saw Yosef coming down in a coffin towards the Yamsuf. So Chazal tell us, Yosef, think about Yosef. Think what he went through. A 17-year-old orphan, orphaned from his mother. He doesn't know where his father is. All his brothers are against him. They sell him and he goes down to Mitzrayim. No Jews around, no one around thrown into a prison and he still say, stays Yosef and he still say, stays that same Yosef all the way through isn't that an amazing thing that is against the nature Yosef worked and acted many a times in his life against against the nature of a normal person Aishis Paitifa she wanted to entice him. He stood strong, a young boy. Yosef, against the nature. When the Yam saw Aroina Shal Yosef, who Yosef stood for against the nature, the Yam had no option. The Yam had to just, Vayonos, the Yam split and Kali Yisrael could go over. Exactly the same thing. If a Yid stands strong, and even if sometimes it's hard, but it's against, and it's against the Teva, and it's against the nature, it stands him in strong, it stands him in good stead for the future. He can stand up to situations where it's also against the Teva, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives him a special bracha. This point of being careful, goes very far. I heard an amazing story. There was a great rabbi called Harav Banet and he was a rov in a particular town and he was invited to a neighboring town for a meeting of the great rabbis of the area and he attended this meeting. At this meeting he took ill and doctors came to try and help him but unfortunately they weren't able and he died and he died in the second town in those days it wasn't so easy to move people from one town to the other to take the coffin from one town to the other and for one reason or the other he was buried in that very town where the meeting took place Back in his hometown, when his Kehillah, when his people heard about the tragedy that their Rav had been Nifta and died in the second town and that he'd been buried there, they cried out and they wrote and they spoke to the Chasm Soifa that he should do something about it. They would like that their dear Rav should be taken from the Besakvoros in the second town 
and reburied in their hometown. He is our Rov. He is our dear Rov. Let him be buried in our town. And the Chasm Sofer heard about this. And the Chasm Sofer wrote an essay on this Indian. And he concluded by saying that it is permissible to take the body of this Rov and rebury him in his hometown. As the Chasm Sofer finished writing this essay, which he wanted to send to these people of the town, he got up from his place and the ink spilt all over the essay and everything got ruined. The Chasm Sofer took this as a message from above not to send this halachic essay to where he was supposed to send it. Three months went past and Rabbi Barnett, the one who was Nifta, the Rav who was Nifta, came to the Chasm Sofer in a dream and said to him the following. I, as a Bocha, when I was young, I was engaged to a certain girl and the Shidduch didn't work out for one reason or another. And there was a lot of pain around that engagement. And the three month engagement has to and had to be paid for. And therefore, in Shomayim, they were goiza that I had to be buried for three months in the second base of Kvoros by the side of this girl who I was once engaged to as a Kapora. But now that the three months are over, I am able to be, it, it is permissible to move me over back to my hometown. When the Hassan Soifa woke up in the morning, the first thing he did was he sent a messenger to that Besa Kvoros, to that cemetery, and he found out, tell me, where is Rabbi Barnett buried and who is buried next to him? And he found out that it was actually true that Rabbi Barnett was buried next to the lady who he was engaged to the first time. And Rabbi Barnett was put there as the Chasm Sofer could see it was with a, with a special message from above. And now that those three months are up, the Chasm Sofer rewrote the essay and sent it and told them that you can now move your dear rabbi back to his hometown. What do we see from this amazing story? There's a price to be paid. Doesn't matter how great the person is, but that if there was in some way along the line, there was some pain involved, then it has to be looked after and it has to be paid for. And those three months of pain, which were not necessarily anybody's fault, but it was a metzias of pain between him and her. So therefore, those three months, she had to be buried over there. Somebody told me an amazing, an amazing parable. There was a group of soldiers with their guns, with the ammunition and somebody kind, let's call him kind, decided that he's going to give these soldiers some wine to drink to make them happy. But it seemed seemingly this wine was something worth talking about and it wasn't just a little bit of wine and all these soldiers became happy, more than happy, drunk. And once they were drunk, they were showing each other their guns. And one said, look how my gun shoots, look how my gun shoots. The end of the story was that lots of, of these soldiers were killed because the soldiers were drunk. Now, if we look at this story, is there anything wrong for a soldier to have a gun? 
Nothing at all. A soldier needs a gun. He has to have a gun. Is there anything wrong for somebody to drink wine and to become happy? Not at all. But when you put the two things together, when you have a soldier who has a gun and you give him wine and he becomes drunk, then you have to know whether that's going to be a good shidduch. Whether they're going to get on well together, the man who's drunk and the man who's got his gun with him. If we know that we have such a powerful, powerful thing called the mouth, called the speech, and we have this capability with talking, we can do good things with it. But on the other hand, we could also kill people with it. We could ruin people's lives. We could hurt people's feelings. Then maybe drinking wine is not such a good shidduch with that person. If a person is not careful the way he speaks and he's even less careful when he drinks wine, then it's a problem. We don't tell a guy like that, drink wine. Be careful how you speak. If you can be careful how you speak, then we can let you have wine. I know somebody that when it comes to Purim, he's very, very careful. And he can be careful, he knows how to be careful, not to overstep the line. And what's his line? His line is, am I still thinking straight? Am I still in control of what I say? Am I 1000% sure that I'm not going to hurt anybody's feelings? Then I know that I'm still okay. And as soon as I'm seeing that I'm not in control, I stop drinking wine. Amazing thing. He wants to drink wine, but he knows that he has a very powerful gun and a very powerful ammunition, which is his mouth. And he wants to be careful. I thought this was an amazing parable for this idea of being careful. Be careful. Be careful because obviously because Hashem wants us to be careful. But be careful because it's for you, for your own sake. Everybody wants, like I said, a pleasant life. Everybody wants that they should have brocha in their life. If we keep an eye on how we talk, and we look after other people, for sure HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to bless us all with a life full of brocha, v'hatzlocha, Amen.